me to find a full one. Okay? Because I'm not allowed to give you an electronic PDF of my book. But last year when I was in India, I was allowed to give you a hard copy. Body of the copy is not going to have that much fun. Um, but what they're doing, what Hema is arranging, which is maybe she's already gone through, she's going to make a photocopy for every client. Okay? So let's run through what you so that at least we'll discuss something you've read before my book, but beforehand. So what we're going to do is this. If, if, because you don't have this yet in terms of in the Dropbox, would you write these numbers down so you know which ones you should read tonight? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lecture right now, give you a PowerPoint presentation that I was going to use as part of the discussion tomorrow. Okay? Part of this. So I'm going to give one of the PowerPoints right now that makes sense. It's about rapid evolution due to natural virus and genetic exchange. So it fits in a lot with what we've been talking about anyway. But what we're going to do is we're not going to go through from here down. What you should do is read these for tomorrow. So it's these numbers right here you'll see. Okay. Those numbers right there are two. They're the designations you'll see. Dropbox for sessions to read. Okay, you'll actually have all of this, but look for 1387 and look for 5918, and then this title will pop up as well in there. It'll be PDF with one of my pictures. Okay, so it's three, four, and five, which are 1387P is the designation on it, 5918P, and then this. Those will go through. So read those. We'll be doing what I've been doing, but talking to folks who hadn't read the material yet, of course, you've heard us as we say in the South East, and so we're going to have that again. But we'll go through these tomorrow for part of the session, the very first, okay? The very first part of the session. All right? And so we will discuss these. These are on, just to give you a little bit of a preview, this is the original paper that described very rapid adaptive radiation in the cichlid fish. So the 1990 paper, that was the landmark. It overturned our ideas about how quickly evolution could occur. Hundreds of species that would pop up basically overnight. Okay. This is one by Scott Hodges and myself. I mentioned earlier it's on Aquilegia. And it's talking about this kind of an event in plants, but in a very different geographic situation. A plant genus that is distributed worldwide, but it looks like it evolved yesterday. That radiated last week, several years ago. In other words, very recent and rapid. And then this one, obviously, will be a follow-on from what I'm about to lecture on today, but natural hybridization is a catalyst for rapid evolutionary change. And we'll see if we get to it. I think we will. Uh, before then, I'll give you some more PowerPoint presentations introducing uh, my book. Okay? And just to review what you will be doing, what we'll be doing when I, this tomorrow is, that's tomorrow morning. And then we leave for Pune, where I'm going to spend, we'll spend six days, six nights, something like that. And when I return, which I had some ice cream today, when I return, I'll, to, I'll continue to give you the introduction to this book, this conceptual framework of my book. And so what you'll need to do is be working on these while I'm gone. Okay? And remember that we've got all this compressed together, so try not to leave this reading until the last instant, because it'll make you go blind. I wrote it. So just remember we have that, and then the final session will be the final two chapters here. Okay? All right. So that's what we'll be doing. It just dawned on me, I'm probably, I need to drop, I'll drop this in the drop box. Let's get that up and close that up. Actually, I'll just get this up. One of the 
the ideas that come out of this kind of information that we talked about today, okay, and that we'll talk more about tomorrow, is that evolution is being radical. Evolutionary diversification is being radical. Um, but this was really unbelievable up until, say, 20 years ago or so. What I mean by that is, let me give you an example, and it will actually be one of the examples of this, this PowerPoint. There are Darwin's ventures. So Peter and Rosemary Grant proposed to go out from Princeton University, go out to the Galapagos Islands, and observe Darwin's ventures, their behavior, their morphology, man to every bird on at least one island, and then watch evolution. Evolutionary change occurs over millions of years. And so Peter and Rosemary were sort of making fun of it at some level, not by anybody else, but the other way around. That was about 1975. I was just starting to do research on that time. What happened was, obviously, this history. For 40 years, they observed evolutionary change. Lots of different kinds of behavioral attributes. So that work has become foundational for us to understand that evolutionary change can be very rapid, natural selection can be very small, but theirs is not the only study. And so what I want to talk about, though, now is something else that people argue, especially coming out of the evolutionary synthesis, was it possible? And that was this idea of the web of life evolutionary stimulus, particularly, I would argue, maybe in changing environments, okay? And so this is what I want to talk to you about, and then tomorrow we'll go back, like I say, in this reading joint, we're going to talk about rapid evolutionary diversification, in particular, two adaptive radiations, one in plants, one in animals, and how that might work. But this is my conceptual framework and shameless advertisement again. What we're talking about is whether divergence with genetic exchange can, can drive, can be very rapid. So can genetic exchange cause rapid evolutionary change, biodiversification, adaptations, whatever it is. Okay. And so I mentioned to you that I would show you Darwin's one figure. When I, okay, in my books, I'll tell the story of myself again, in my books, Allowed a certain number of words. For some reason, they really emphasize this today. My are only allowed for a thousand words. Period. I don't know why they think that's the case, but apparently they think we're right way. And so, I'm allowed for about a hundred thousand words ish, about thirteen hundred references ish, and I'm allowed about sixty to one hundred figures, depending on what kind of figures I have. Darwin had. One figure in his book. Okay. I've overturned science, right? I've never overturned science. No, no, okay, we're good. So this figure must have summarized what he was trying to communicate, right? I mean, this must have been to him the simple modification. Starting down here with one or a few forms and ending up up here with different forms from down here. And with lots, remember I threw it out. Lots of extinction events, losing branches, but obviously they're not coming back together, right? They're not anastomosing, they're not fusing, they're not exchanging genes. And, it, and we've already talked about this in contrast to that. Obviously, we have something called the web of life that we've been working on and discussing the implications of for 20 some odd years or longer. And we've talked about the web of life is due exchange of genes through a number of different processes, mechanisms, sexual reproduction, viral recombination, horizontal gene transfer, whatever, and actually transfer of those kinds of information. And we talked about this, okay, that it affects 
that adaptive and adaptive evolution allows for adaptation, and it has these kind of attributes to it, which are very different from the predictions for other trees of life, in the sense that we don't expect convergence to occur very often, we sure don't expect competitive evolution between the tree of life, and it's contingent, it's what you're starting with, so it's not going to repeat, and it's obviously the tree of life is emerges without genetic discrimination, right? There's, there are no genes moving around, but now what we know is that this picture, and I mentioned it Way too simplistic. It's just much more through evolutionary time, through evolutionary history, biodiversity or biological record of it. Genetic exchange has been one of the major factors in human evolution. Okay, major transitions, whole genome duplications that have affected bit foods and hybridization foods, transfer of retroviruses in urban plants exchanging genes between parasitic plants and non-parasitic hosts. All sorts of different kinds of things. And we'll talk about, as you guys read through my book, you'll see the sorts of examples I'm talking about. Okay? And at the end of this, I'll talk about us, about humans. And I'll show you a portion of a table, a very brief portion, a short, small portion of a table that Krishna Ekpate and I have in the review paper we just that we just mailed off and we're inviting to write for the Institute for Religion and Evolution on adaptive exchanges. So all these different kinds of events that have been occurring throughout the biological record, throughout the development of biodiversity in this biosphere. The question is, you know, why and how and what are the uh, effects of that? Okay, so this is a cartoon. A friend of mine, knew that I was a Christian, sent to me, also knew I was going to retrieve my house and school to take the photo. So this is supposed to be Noah on the ark with all the animals, and this is an ex example, cartoon, example, one goal for this lecture is to demonstrate that genetic exchange can rapidly lead to evolutionary knowledge. So Noah is giving the rabbit a really hard time saying he's been a very naughty rabbit, and he has caused genetic exchange evolution all over the boat, all right, all over the ark. And if you want to see some more examples, but also investigation of how, not that they have some kind of, but anyway, how this kind of rapid evolutionary knowledge could occur, you might, I, I wrote a paper, or an invited review for systematic botany that just came out earlier, like the first volume this year. The only reason I'm saying that is that um, when they invited me to do to write this, I, I haven't published in Systematic Botany since my very first paper that was said there in 1978. So I, but I still have this warm feeling about this journal, and I like the journal. I want to do it. Anyway, I asked them, could I, could I write about other things other than plants? And the editor actually wasn't mortified. You know, he wasn't shocked, I guess. But he, you know, he was. And he said, what do you want to write about? Viruses, bacterias, plants, and animals. And he said, Can you write more about plants? <laughs> Systematic plants. And I said, Of course I can. So I have more examples of plants. But anyway, this is the question, okay? And another story on me is that I was asked this question back in 2000. I was basically challenged to think about this and buy some. Uh, editors of a volume, in fact, the, the third paper that I put, the third reading that I put you through that is prepared for you tomorrow, um, they said, would you try, we're, we're publishing, or we're going to put together this book, this distributed volume on rapid evolution, just across the board, rapid evolution, not just genetic exchange, rapid evolution. Would you write a chapter on natural hybridization and rapid evolution? And my response to them, this was not that long ago, like 2010 or something. My response was, I don't think you want to be known as radical. I mean, sure, you know, all these things about evolution are great, and you know, you should do that, and you should write a book on it. And they said, really? And they weren't even working in my field. And so then I got to thinking about it. I said, well, 
well, let me think about it. Because I was afraid I wouldn't know what to call it. And then I got to think about it, and I realized how stupid I was. And I didn't realize how wrong I was either. But how stupid I was, you know, to, to not realize that this genetic revolution kind of thing is exactly what we expect. Because when we do experimentation across the virgin forms, whether they're viruses or bacterias or plants or animals, we end up with a lot of phenotypic and genotypic genomic richness. A lot of it is neutral, seems neutral. A lot of it is maladaptive. And then some of it is really a, you know, increase in genetics. And it happens over a few generations. So anyway, so I wrote my paper. And it changed my outlook on this text, or sorry, this topic. All right, but this is not a new idea. I really wish one day I'd have new ideas, okay? And I, I haven't had one that I know of yet. So it's not really a brand new idea. Either Darwin wrote about it or somebody else. In this case, this is from Anderson and Stebbins, uh, a paper called Natural Hybridization as an Evolutionary Stimulus from a 1954 evolution paper that they wrote. And they wrote that it has been established by recent work Paleontology and systematics. What they're talking about is in the fossil record, okay, in eukaryotes. Mostly animals, but some plants. There have instead been bursts of evolutionary activity. Evolution has not proceeded at a slow, even rate. There have instead been bursts of evolutionary activity. The rapidity of evolution in these bursts of creative evolution may well have been due to hybridization. So they're only talking about genetic exchange kinds of events with eukaryotes. What I'm going to talk about to you is examples of viruses, prokaryotes, and antisense, and then go into and consider others. And then go into plants and animals. Right? So I want to discuss all of this. Oh, by the way, remember, you can hold up your hand, interrupt me, and let them get to it. All right. So, how about some examples? Remember, rapid evolution. Can it occur due to genetic exchange? Can genetic exchange cause rapid evolution? So another story on me. I'm old, okay? We didn't know this, but I'm old. And because I'm old, in North America, especially in the U.S., my doctor calls me each year and says, because you're old, we need to immunize you against influenza. Okay, he doesn't exactly put it that way, but he says, because you're over the age of all right. And so last year, this year I've gotten an in, influenza immunization, okay, vaccination, and I haven't caught the flu yet. Last year I had the immunization, and 80% of us in North America who had that immunization caught the flu. Okay. And so the question arises immediately. Someone said to me, "How did I have the flu? The bronchitis or the whatever?" And I said, "Oh, I know, I know exactly what you had the flu. I know exactly why I caught." The flu. Why did I catch the flu? Because the CDC and the WHO guessed wrong because of rapid viral evolution due to recombination. Okay? So, viral recombination, this is not last year's data, but I like this for your picture. So, this is from 1999 to 2004. In 99, the major variant that was circulating in various parts of the world was that. Each one of those bars is one of the eight influenza genes. Okay? And if you look, the next year during the flu season, you had this and that. And then look what happens in 2001, and then in 2002, 2003, and then back down here, you have nothing like what you started with there. So what happened last year was they guessed something like this, and what they ended up with was something like that. Okay? So recombination, and there's some point mutations too that you work into this, but recombination mainly meant that they put together a cocktail of something like that and injected me, and what we ended up being was those two of that. Rapid, rapid, rapid evolution in these kinds of viruses. And maybe you're saying we have it in bugs. Okay, fine. What about bacteria? Okay, so I travel a lot, and I sometimes am done with some microbes. Okay? Ironically, Rarely in India, or China, places that are very different from where I live, but other places, okay, like the UK, you know, like England. England 
always is. And I guess it's because we kick the bastards that we do have to run out of the water. We're still getting those bastards. You guys better not be me with my point. I'm just pointing that out. There's a lot more reasons. They're probably still mad at you. All right. So I get gastroenteritis in there. Why do I get gastroenteritis? The reason I get gastroenteritis is because there's a very virulent form of this campus factor that's due to this recombination. Here are, we'll talk about this oh, soon. I don't remember when I give this to you. Probably the first time we're reading my book, chapter of my book. It's like chapter of the Marines. But anyway, here you have a gene genealogy of genes from this. And this is unrecombined genes. You have these nice, discrete clays of campus factor of different colors, okay? And these are all coli, right? This is the nasty one. But here you have recombined genes. Somewhere else in the genome, you have genes that have been recombined. You have these regression events, is what they call them, not we call them horizontal gene transfer. But you end up with these recombined genes with not having these kind of discrete uh, clusters. In other words, you have discordance. And they know that this is due to the transfer of genes from a, a different lineage into this. And to look at it a little bit different, we're asking about rapid. Since the development of agricultural practices is when these different events of introduction of foreign material into this now uh, pathogenic clone, this big pathogenic clone from this Campylobacter that I have patients in 2005 and 17. Okay? And so, relatively recent, once again, not hundreds of thousands of years, not millions of years. Okay, now maybe you're saying, yeah, but once again, that's bacteria. We know they have all of them. Okay, what about humans? Okay, can we have some degree of something? I'm going to show you this, but I'm also going to use this as an example of an of, of a organism later on in another uh, lecture that I'll give to you about the web of life. Uh, one of those organisms that we deal with in our ecological setting is the cause of invasion. This is the cause of invasion of Chagas, okay? Major nasty disease that we have in the New World, absolutely devastating, especially in Mexico, Central America, South America. But this is the organism that causes this disease. And in the last much more recent 23,000 years, this is a gene tree for many, many, many isolates. You won't have to see anything on this. Hopefully you can see this in the back, the little stars. Every one of those is an interprogressed lineage of Lots of genetic exchange, and many of these have been documented as recombinants that are much more virulent, good at what they do, than non-recombinants. But the other thing, and I'll show you this panel in another talk, all of these are ancient hybrid lineages. As a matter of fact, as another anecdote, when they were first genome sequencing for Panasonic cruzi, they could not get it to reassemble it. They could not figure out why. Why could they not assemble this simple, it should be a simple and it was a small genome. The reason was is because the lineage that they were looking at were the hybrids. They didn't know it because they didn't expect them to hybridize recently and they sure didn't expect an ancient hybridization. Like I say, they should have played with it. Okay? So this kind of event, once again, though all of these are very recent events, they're important for this organism and they happen relatively rapidly. Okay, but let's also talk about some plagues. And this is our first real discussion about the pollen plague. Okay, we'll talk about this and you'll read about it much more at our AdWords page. You go through the material in my book. Okay, but this is a major evolutionary process of plants. Tragopogon is a group of plants that Pam and Doug Soltis and their group work on. And it's uh, Tragopogon dubius, Tragopogon portfolius, and 
of the trade code on pretenses, okay, are the three Bitcoin parental units. And Mesilus and Meros are the allopoly units formed between clauses between these three species. But hopefully what you can see is Mesilus has been formed 13 independent times and Meros 7 independent times. In other words, you can get this kind of a morphological variation, but they're considered the same species, the same allopolyploid species, formed 13 independent times and 7. The staggering part of this is, is in the last 80 years. Okay? Since these were introduced to a certain region in North America, where they overlap, and they formed these new allopolyploid species. So in other words, they had herbarium specimens throughout this area, collected through decades and decades before, previous to the last eight years, and these were not there. They did not exist. And so in the last 80 years, you've had this kind of major difference. Yeah, so no, these are the only two allopolyploids but they do form hybrid populations. They do form hybrid cells, if you will, hybrid swarms, too, right? And they're, it's not as just as simple as this because you can have interbreeding amongst the allopolyploids. You can have some interbreeding from the allopolyploids back to the parents. So it's actually a little more complex. But when they do the you know, resequencing of Mycelus and Meris, that's where they're getting this information to say 7 to 13. It's probably higher than that. Whenever I show this slide, a Pam sent me this slide, Pam Solis. And whenever I show this slide, I used to have like 3 to 7 and 7 to 13 because I got it from different papers. And Pam says, oh, it's much more than this and this and 7 to 13. I'm like, okay, well, this makes it more. In, 80, in less than 80 years, you've had that many independent evolutionary steps to species. We can argue about whether all seven of those should be called Mirus. Right? We can talk about this. They're polyploid. So from a phylogenetic species concept, does that rise to phylogenetic species concept? No. Right? Because they're polyploid and they're not monophyletic. But they're polyploid anyway because they're between two species. I don't know that that really matters. Okay. So, plants. Let's get to the best plants. Finally. All right. So, not really. I don't think it is. So, Louisiana irises. Um, so, what we've done over the years is, and I'll describe this a little bit in detail because, oops, I think I need to get the microphone. So, the, I want to describe what we've done in terms of experimental set up a number of different experiments that I'll talk to you guys about as we're going through some power, PowerPoint presentations and also when you are reading the book again and looking at it. So what we did early on, 20 some odd years ago, is we decided to make genetic mapped populations. Before we could do population genomics, we decided to buy sequencing, whatever. So, but these have been incredibly rich for us in terms of testing hypotheses about adaptive evolution, etc. So what we did is we went, we took our various species, we really only have three that we were dealing with, well, four that we're dealing with, but I took those species and I crossed one kind, each one genotype from one species with another. And in this case, I took Iris fulva and an Iris brevipollis, and if you want to know about the tell you why it's not Anyway, an iris brevicollis genotype and an iris fulva. And I crossed just one plant of each. I crossed them and I made epiploids. Now, these plants are not just sexually reproducing. They're long-lived plants. In fact, they're basically immortal unless there's something wrong with them genotypically. And what I mean by that is they reproduce asexually, too. They put out rhizomes. And when you break those rhizomes off, throw them out into nature and try to kill them to see what they're adapted to. 
or we do it in the greenhouse, but we always keep a piece back to grow up or keep some of the pieces actually back to grow up in the greenhouse and keep them around. Okay, so I took these same parents the next year and the F1, one F1 I crossed into this parent with multiple copies of it to really get a lot of seeds and another F1 into this parent to get many, many, many back off seeds in that direction. So what I did was I, and by the way, I can say I did this because I did it to get my students to think this is mind-blowingly boring and I can't break things up in three minutes. Okay? It's not so fun way. And so anyway, so that's what we did and I got, by doing that, I got reciprocal back cross populations. Okay? Experimental back cross populations and mapping populations. Moved a lot of genetic mapping. All sorts of other things too. So what we did in this experiment I'm about to show you is we took this not all of the gene clones. We have hundreds of back cross clones in both ribosomes, individual gene clones, and we break up the ribosomes up and we go out into nature. And so what I'm going to show you is remember we're talking about rapid evolution. Can genetic exchange lead to rapid evolution in a few generations? Okay. So what I'm going to talk to you about is the integration and adaptation of flooding. So iris fulva, the red flower, is flood tolerant. It, it occurs in water about that deep year-round. So it's not a lot of water, but it's enough to make it, you know, have an anaerobic condition around it. Its roots and rhizomes all year round. Whereas Rebecollis is flood intolerant. It grows upslope in dry soil, it's very porous, so it rains a lot on it, and it dries out really quickly. So it's actually a drought tolerant. We demonstrated that in experiments as well. So we know this from experimentation and, and this from experimentation, but also from looking at them, where do they, you know, where do they exist, if they do. All right, so given that information, we went out and decided we were going to run an experiment these are relatively old data, but we have new experiments now that are really cool because we're actually doing population experiments. But each, if you can see it, each one of these little things here in the flag that's marking a rhizome, we had two plots, or two portions of this plot. So we had, if, what you do is we go out and we tie the rhizomes. This part I didn't do. We is my postdoc, Noah Clark, at the time, who's now a professor in Texas. And so Noah tied on thousands of pieces of rhizome from all of these genotypes, replicated them, parental as well as back cross, onto to uh, screen. Okay? We've done these kinds of experiments both many, many times. We tied them onto the screen. This is the dry portion, the Brevicolis portion. This is a waterway back here, what we call the bayou. And he walked down into the bayou and plunged the rhizomes, copies of all these, into the bayou and did that as well had blood tolerance for other species too. And he did this in two different areas, okay? Two different plots. So he replicated this in another plot. This is a terrible place to do this work. Absolutely awful. Bugs eat you alive. It's hot. There's lots of nasty poisonous snakes. Not like in India, Australia, wherever. But still, there's a lot of alligators in here. It's just, it's just not a nice place. Okay, I should tell you this. But anyway, so it's not a nice place. When we went out there to choose this, this was not a place that, this is a natural setting for these guys, okay? This is an area of a big hybrid area, but there aren't any irises close to it. So we chose these two plots. And while we were out there, no one who was new to my lab, was a good friend of mine, and we had shared grants, and now he's still publishing it, and writing up papers for four other people from that whole thing. So because you're going to think I'm a terrible mentor. So anyway, Nolan noticed these lines on these trees, and he said, Mike, I think those are flood marks. They probably should have planted here. And I said, those are not flood marks. This is not a flood plain. It's a flood plain down way up on the map. It's not a flood plain. He said, Mike, those are flood marks. I really think those are flood marks. And I said, look, you're new to this area. You've never worked in southern Louisiana. You haven't worked on these irises. You need to just shut up and do it. Okay? I am your son. So I was really rude about it. And uh, he said, all right. So he and his, you know what he told me, he and his wife was not a scientist. He and his wife and his parents, who were not a scientist, went 
went out and, and basically in the hospital for a bug bite after they did this thing. And that's, so this is what it looked like. And it looked, this is about this deep of water, and it looked like that for three and a half months. It is definitely flooded temporarily. It was exactly right. And so anyway, um, he forgave me because most of his viruses, 97.3% of everything died, but they died beautifully. And so they died beautiful death. And so these, this is the table, and survivorship here. So Brevicolis, that flood, flood not taught them, they did not do it. Of course, we had hundreds and hundreds of pieces of it out there on the 13 genotypes because we didn't expect it. Anyway, this was a mistake. We should have had a lot of genotypes. Anyway, 0% survivorship, 5.5% survivorship for backcrosses of rib, we'll come back to that, 5.2% backcrosses of full of blood tolerant backcross, it looks like this one over here, and it's more than 27%, so it, it makes sense. But this is what is important and interesting, right? Because why this is going, these guys in this hundreds of genotypes, are vastly more similar genomically to that than they are to this. So the question is, why did they survive? And obviously the question we wanted to test was, was it because of introgression, adaptive introgression from full-blown blood tolerance genes in the brown cause in one generation? Okay? And so the answer is yes. And I'll, I'm not going to show you some data that we have but the data that we did have uh, that I'm showing you, these are the Brevicolis that survived. Now remember, a backcross in one generation is going to have a wide genotypic and phenotypic spread. So it's more like the recurrent parent appearing in positive instance that overlap broadly with that. But it's also going to have a lot of allelic variation, a wide allelic variation. So the Brevicolis that that survived the flood, Brevicolis, sorry, Brevicolis backcrosses, had two and a half times more fulvo material in them on average than those that don't. So introgression from fulvo apparently, we would argue, led to this survivorship. But we had something else we could do. Remember I told you that these are the long-lived perennials that we have in the greenhouse, etc. We had already genetically mapped every one of our plants, all the hundreds of back crosses. So we knew exactly what genotype would survive, and we knew exactly what full of yields would get those genotypes. We were able to actually identify the chromosomal of the linkage of those regions. Two major, that gave a major effect, but it's probably not. Two major regions of the, of the, of the genome caused these to survive, and it was because of negative epistatic interactions between those two regions. So if you had the right phase, you made it. If you had the wrong phase, allelic combination, you could not So this is, in one hybrid generation, we actually had this kind of rapid, radical, adaptive trait expression, okay, that, that caused blood tolerance to be transmitted. This is not the last example I'll show you of this, okay, but I'll show you this kind of a rapid change in chromosome code, which is what was the case. But what we also are doing right now, and this brings us up to date, is we have naturally, so that was an experiment, right? It was an accidental experiment. We run a lot of those. I'm not exactly sure why. You think you're playing well, then all of a sudden something happens and you go, well, that's not great. I wonder what we can get out of this so that we can get grandmother again. Um, so this, though, is natural hybrid population between those same two species. We did not transplant any of these plants or anything. The little blue dots, each one of the dots, actually blue or red, are individual plants that were genotyped. The blue dots, every one of these dots is a hybrid. It was this here. The blue dots are more genomically like Brevicolis. The red dots are more genomically like Fulva, but they're all hybrid. The yellow line is the water line, okay? That's the margin of the water. Everything in here is wet. And by 
by the way, I showed this slide for the very first time in a symposium. It was a measure of facts when we adopted here many years ago. And I showed this, and um, they were all just within French houses. I'm not bragging about the community. No, I'm really not bragging about this within French houses. What I'm laughing about is when I showed this, wow, God, because they were all looking at Alpine and stuff. Really? That's a centimeter, okay? So anyway, this is just a little depression in southern Louisiana, and any depression, it's like a billiard table there. That's why New Orleans, which sank a little bit when Katrina came through, when the water went in, it never left, okay? Unfortunately. And so it took a long time. But anyway, everything in here is submerged. So the question is, why? How can we have Brevicollis hybrids submerged? Well, obviously, our inference is, that they have introgressed to the lithosphere, like the trees, from the fold. We have not tested this, okay? But what we have tested is another hybrid mode. The reason we haven't tested that one, this is sad to say, we had it lined up to test, and they bulldozed the front porch. We were going to go, because it's private property. Um, you're in the U.S., everything's private property, right? Especially in the South, in those cities. Or it's government property that they let people destroy. So anyway, we lost that one. We have that amount of genotypic information, but we don't have our mapping information. Yes. That's adapted in this case is, is specific and it's not random. Okay, it's, it's actually certain loci that are adapted. Oh, oh, you mean the recombination events that are, that are, recombination is actually genome, genetically not actually, that even that is not a random event. However, if we had not had the recombination in those regions, we would have not seen the transfer. But in that case, it, it, it adapted switches. In that case, then, or in that way, we could consider it random or idiosyncratic. You know, that it's a recombination event occurred in that region, happens to occur in that region, and transfers it. Biotic mechanisms, we, I would say idiosyncratic rather than random. Idiosyncratic in the least bit. Those alleles had to be transferred for the adaptation to be transferred to the genome. Same, and they might not have been had recombination in some organisms. But recombination pattern in an organism like us are genetically determined where those recombinations are. So they're in shallower water around here, deeper water out there. Um, you actually see the bulbose tracking in being shallow in the water as well, which is what you see it in year round. But what I can tell you is, regardless of the depth, they're actually out in fairly deep water too. But regardless of the depth, they don't like to be submerged in pure water. You know, they don't want to go back that far. Experiments and also, once again, you just don't see it like this in these in natural populations. They're up here outside of the water. This is where they are. It's more up here, out way away from the water or whatever. That is the more typical submersion or deep water submersion. These hybrids, this is a wild hybrid. Yeah, this is a natural look. Yeah, the C 
similarity is that we know what the adaptations are in these two species in terms of blood tolerance. And so the correlation here is that these are genomically blue ones, and the red ones, but genomically blue ones are almost completely protocolic. They actually are an advanced generation of backlogs. It's estimated to be green for backlogs. We have backlogs as well in this one. Okay, that's one thing. It's not even a meat ball. So they're very similar. They're very difficult to tell from row to row. Phenotypically, you can't tell from what they're saying from row to row. Uh, genotypically, because we had enough markers. What we don't know, which does kills me, is that we didn't get to the time to actually map the markers and ask whether or not the alleles from the bulbar were in those two language groups, like we would expect. What we have been able to do, though, is more detailed analysis where we had we have a lot of adaptation, adaptive traits. But what we're working on right now is this, where we've looked at another hybridizing thing he's done. We have Ramacolis in long habitat, Bulba in long habitat, and a few others in dry. But what we also have is obviously we have other adaptations. Okay, Bulba and Ramacolis don't share pollinators. Okay, Bulba and Ramacolis flowering groups have differences. Bulba and Ramacolis have a lot of differences in their adaptive makeups. So what we've done here is gone into uh, extensive hybridizing area. We have 480 individuals, and we mapped them out, and we took environmental measurements from every one of them, which we have not done, except for the flooding, you know, the depth of water, we really haven't done on those other plants. So in this case, we know how much light they're getting, what kind of soil and all that. We have our maps this time. We have our map SNP website. We use, actually, we use a SNP chip, which I would never do again. That's just a little aside. If someone says to me, why don't you use a SNP chip? say, well, I'd get really great data, but it would be really, really expensive, okay? So there's better ways to do it than this. But what this meant was we were using transcriptomics, i.e. RNA genes, so we knew that it was expressed. So it's not random GPS or genotyping by sequence to which we did as well. But anyway, so we have that. 223 of these loci have this kind of a frequency difference between the species. I'm giving you a lot of detail because it's important. This is necessary to be able to use your Bayesian approach or your non-Bayesian approach uh, to tell whether an allele likely came from full or red blood color. Okay? The interesting thing is that 223 of those, of the 223, 85 of those loci show significant departures from the new plant introgression. Okay? That introgression could cause discovery of this. But anyway, 85 of those are passing across the boundary between those two, the semi-permeable boundary between those two species and ending up at very high frequency, or they're being stopped. So it's non-neutral patterns. So the non-neutral patterns are under dominance. This is just a figure showing a really sharp step decline, which indicates that at this locus, the alleles from one species are not going into the other species, period. And then at this allele, at this locus, though, you have adaptive introgression or over dominance selection of more than half, where you have this shallow decline, and that just happens to be the shape of the, the, this methodology gives you these kinds of decline analysis. And so selection against hybrid genotypes here, the selection favoring the hybrid genotypes, and what we're, what we're looking at are all the different genomic regions associated with adaptive traits and asking whether or not we have adaptive trait introgression in the regions likely affected with blood tolerance, but at specific genes rather than new genes for some reason. Okay. But keep in mind, rapid ad adaptive introgression, this is a natural hybrid zone. In one generation, back across one, blood tolerance was transferred in our experiment. This is a natural hybrid zone. We're already detecting this. These are natural hybrid zones that are not one generation. They're not backlogs one generation. Rather, they're advanced generation hybrids that are still relatively recent. And they're not in the open here. They're only one another in the generation, but it's thousands of them. Okay. 
so reminding you, this is what we're talking about. Now I'm going to move into some of the animal analogies. And I'll give you one that I'm going to use. Dogs and wolves. The reason, there's a number of reasons I like this. I like dogs, okay? And I wouldn't have a wolf as a pet, but I like dogs. And so what we have, that's one of the reasons. The other reason is because this involves my, my wife's ancestors. Ancestors came across the Mary Land Bridge from East Asia S, okay, or a thousand years ago or whatever, and they were dragging their dogs with them, right? They brought domestic dogs with them. And so, what does that have to do with anything? Well, in North America, and actually in Europe as well, like in Italy, what we see are different forms of gray wolves, so called gray wolves. And in North America and in Europe, we have melanistic wolves. Black wolves, and we have the kind of more lighter color gray wolf. These guys occur in forested areas. These guys occur in open areas. Okay, this polymorphism was just assumed to be just that—a polymorphism that maybe selection was favoring this in a darker environment because the prey captures them or something like that because the prey wouldn't see them as easily in the forest as they would have been. That was a that was a scenario and hypothesis. But what actually has been called melanistic form is that when Francis' ancestors brought their dogs in the forest, those domestic dogs, which by the way had been domesticated, say, however long ago, 60,000 years or so ago, from great wolves in Europe or somewhere, not in North America, but somewhere. Those domesticated dogs hybridized with the gray wolf. And that hybridization caused the interaggression of coat polymorphisms that turned the wolves, that gave the wolves the opportunity to be black. Okay, to be melanistic. And when the genomic work by uh, Anderson et al., but it was Bob Wayne's group, was done, they detected that the alleles that were there, first of all, were from melanins, almost identical to the dog melanins, or dark melanin color. And also that there was a region around those, those alleles that indicated a selective strain. Strong selection, driving these coat color alleles at very high frequencies in the part of the gray wolf's brain region. And like I say, it was forested areas, so one of the scenarios or suggested hypotheses was Darker wolves survive better. Okay? Turns out that that's partially right, but not the main reason for this selective sweep. The selective sweep for the dark colored wolves is mainly due to sexual selection. I just read about this and this uh, and heard about it at a meeting in March, I think it was. Uh, I need my wife here. She remembers this stuff. But anyway, Bob Wayne was there and he talked about this. It turns out that female wolves, regardless of their color, like black males, okay? Like melanistic males. And so in areas where this integration occurs, the female sexual selection is driving the actual fitness of the darker color wolves. There is a slight survivorship advantage as well for heterozygous. So both are going on, but the sexual selection, female choice, is really what has driven this scenario. The reason they know that, by the way, once again, you know, I told you ecological behavior for experiment are difficult things to do. They're incredibly important for understanding evolutionary processes like adaptive evolution. It's because they know watching the people in these forested areas and you know, collaring all of them, watching who they're mating with, how many pups are they having, blah, 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 blah. Okay? For decades, so they now can look at the genomic and the behavior and go, why not? Okay, very, very recently, not millions of years, not hundreds of thousands of years, the 
what about Darwin's finches? One of my favorites. Darwin's finches, very, very diverse group in the Galapagos. Okay, lots of different kinds of finches. More than just finches here. Lots of different beak shapes. That's an important Darwin finds. What had happened is that what did happen. Remember, Peter and Rosemary went out and sat, Peter and Rosemary and Grant went out and sat on the rock for 40 years. Not continuously, but every year they went out there. They banded, I don't know why they did this, except to kill ducks. I saw also the St. Mary Bobbins. Bob Wayne was getting that out of school in the St. Sons. I was in Atlanta first. And the American Association of Physical Anthropologists. I know, don't even ask. And so, anyway, Peter and Rosemary went out, and they went to this rock, and they sat on it, and they banded every bird, every bird, and they looked to see who they made it with, and the, who they were nesting with, how many babies they had, whether the babies made it bad on food, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And for the first, actually, I guess it's 76, but not a little bit earlier, but anyway, for the, and now they've done this for over 40 years, but 76 to 81, that they had interspecific pairings. Those birds, those females, laid eggs, and the eggs often hatched. They had chicks. Not a single hybrid, though, in, from any of those mates fledged. They never made it to adulthood. They always died before adulthood. Okay? So they never had a hybrid survive. As of 82, they had lots of hybrids start surviving. And the reason that, the main reason that that happened was because, and they've demonstrated a lot of different ways now, is because they had a major environmental perturbation, as of this area, where you had this time. And so you lost your large seeds, plants, and you gained all of these small seeds. So the Darwin's finches that only could survive on large seeds died out. They were selected against. And those that had could process small seeds actually could, their fitness increased. But what really happened, and I'll show you these data in another PowerPoint, what really happened was hybrid classes outdistanced in fitness all of the parents. In other words, no hybrid at all. Lifetime fitness of hybrid missed in the patch of honey for 40 years total. The honey now passed this now. They just published some of these. Know what genes control that, what regulatory elements are, and the fact that that regulatory element that affects beak shape and size has been transferred back and forth between finches, Galapagos finches, throughout the evolution of the entire globe. So it's a combination, they argue, it's a combination of interbreds and hybridization, adaptive interbreds and hybridization, and natural selection. Okay? But what happened here, the signature that they saw from 1980 to 2005, was between these two species, Geospes importus and Geospes standards, converged, so this standardized difference in genetic distance and beak shape converged in both beak shape as well as their genetic distance or just overall their genotypic differentiation. Now what they know, when they bring it out here, is that really what was driving this kind of adaptive introgression was both neutral markers, overall their genetic diversity and differentiation point, but also this beak shape convergence was due to adaptive trait introgression, beak shape regulatory elements of the one that could process small seeds into one that could only process large. So what about this? Okay. Can you know once again?
again, we're talking about rapid evolutionary change. So what about our species? And I'm going to talk about our species a number of different times in this week's study. But I'm going to just give you some introduction to this. Homo species, late Pleistocene, overlap and the opportunity for regression. So this is a panel out of that book that I told you nobody knows exists. Okay, the figure I put together. And I just gathered some information about various species from our genus. And I asked the question, what did paleobiologists say about when they occurred, when was their time horizon, and where did they occur? And I asked the question, did they overlap with other forms of time and space? Okay? And this is, though, just a general, at the time, yeah, they overlap. Us and Erectus probably overlap in time. When you see the arrows, that means we also overlap with general space. That could mean we didn't overlap in exactly the same space, but there's good evidence that we did. The same patterns, okay? And I didn't have them here. So I'll show you information about the individual caves that we apparently share at the same time. We can find Homo sapiens artifacts and Homo deanthropologists artifacts in the same cave at the same time, okay? So it looks like we did occupy. Now, for, for many of you, maybe for all of us, this may be not new news that we have aggressively hybridized with other species. Okay? But you need to understand that when I published this book in 2008, some of the reviewers were quite vicious in saying, first of all, I, was, I wasn't a paleoanthropologist or an anthropologist, so how dare me write about this? I thought, Secondly, they said there's no evidence and there won't ever be any evidence that we have aggressively hybridized with the other species. So Mike needs to stop saying we did. Okay. I thought there was actually some decent genomic, it wasn't genomic, but genetic variation, but also the fact that we had overlapped and we were a primate, and all of them I had never found, literally, this is from a bunch of reviews for the book, I had never found a primate group that does not show several primate primates are one of the best clays in general to show integrated hybridization and time and extension. Across the board, they're one of the best clays to do that. Okay? We were a primate, I was. So I was thinking, why wouldn't we have hybridized and aggressed? Boy, did I catch that one. Well, as of 2010, obviously the idea that we had to hybridize with them was new. Okay? Because they Sequence, the anthropologists have been the same. But our old hypothesis, ironically, in 2014, I showed this to you, is that we had various admixture events from Phyllis, various admixture events, right, that have involved our species before we left Africa, we were hybridizing with other intergressive, apparently with other emerging lineages. So there's more than just us. And then once we left Africa, it's now been detected over and over again that we had mixed, we intergressively hybridized with other forms of our genus. Okay. And so the new hypothesis that I hadn't shown you before of this is this. Okay. And so this is one, once again, that came up during this American Association of Physical Anthropology that I was made aware of by Gordon. So here, hopefully, you can see that there is a, there have now been many, many events, not just into us, okay, but from our clade or ancestors of our clade, uh, of our species group, into the anthropomorphs, okay. Also, extinct forms into other now extinct forms of the Denisovans, okay. It's probably a record. Guessing, but they in the Denisovan genome there is material from some other divergent maybe from Orcus or from Orcus lineage. And you can see that Neanderthal leads us into another form of Denisovans. And then of course, much introgression, our regression. So it's very complex. It is we are a stereotypical primate. This is exactly what primate groups do. Boo, chimpanzee. Lemurs, whatever you want, New World monkeys, 
if they overlap, you end up with an aggressive hybridization problem. And so this is a way to picture it a little bit more as well, and that is that in this case, this is a new study as well that just came out, Denisovan integration. These are all the different chromosomes and elements of our species on the same piece. Every time you see a little blue mark, that's a region of significant integration, detection of integration from Denisovan into Columbus. Okay, so there are large regions that did not integrate. This is a mosaic genome based on Denisovan integration. Mosaic, okay? There are pieces of Denisovan in there, but it's not, this region is missing Denisovan material. There are limitations. There is loss, if they were there, there's loss of that Denisovan material. The others are Neanderthal, the red is Neanderthal lenses integration into various populations or region components of our species. Okay, and if you can just glance around this, you can see all of the different regions that have integrated from now extinct lineages, okay? And another way to look at this, and this, you know, you can look at you guys, you can look at probably me, you know, um, and this would be my wife, Francis. So if you look at Denisovan ancestry, you can see the highest is in East Asia, folks. So that's why I say my wife and his ancestors were born in East Asia. You guys are down in here, scattered across from here, probably because a lot of migration goes in and out of this particular area, right? But you have a broader spread of Denisovan, percentage of Denisovan, and various folks from South Asia. I would have less Denisovan ancestry in me to be potentially Asian, West, or Asian. Okay? I could be surprised. But this is the kind of inheritance pattern. But okay, so what? We have material from now extinct species. Well, so what? I mentioned to you that Christian Egg and I have put together a uh, trans ecology and evolution uh, invited manuscript. Let's see if we can see what this is doing here right now. This is a portion of that table I told you. That we have, and it has a hungry number and variety of organisms that show adaptive exchange. So we go from viruses, humans, other mammals, and rodents, okay? So all kinds of adaptive exchanges that we've got in different ways. But anyway, this is with regard to our species. So if you just glance across this, hopefully you can see that this is from, this is the number. This is N2. So ancient, now extinct lineages of our species into our species. And if you look across here, the response to UV is the adaptation of that particular gene. Denisovans end up on this microRNA loci that have gone to a very high frequency, indicating a selective sweep. But in this case, the adaptation is unknown. What actual trait it is. But if you run down here, innate immunity, hypoxia pathways, hematogenesis, metabolisms, and repair, and disease resistance. The reason I have this red is because this, these have been suggested to be maladaptive. And so the question is, are they really maladaptive or not? Are they pre-reproductive? In other words, and does it really matter that, does it really mean that it was maladaptive for Denisovans or for us from this DNA to have the propensity for type 2 diabetes when we didn't have a high blood or sugar density. Okay, does that make sense? So those are, but we wanted to talk about these as being possible maladaptive. But anyway, so we have all of these different kinds of adaptive responses, and it's much less than 50,000 years. Hey, Christian. So much less than 50, I just wanted to say a little bit of whatever. Much less than 50,000 years, and in fact, what we obviously expect is that these were introduced over a very, like Louisiana irises, over a very abbreviated time period, right? Because you're talking about getting these kinds of things fixed relatively quickly 
in a, a small portion of the time that you could do that over the last you know, six or so. So this is you know evidence that introgression, genetic exchange in general can be rapid, but also can be can be like with the wolves and the domesticated dogs, like with the human nurses, like with dogs and finches, can actually be So, what we talked about was this, okay? What we tested, what I suggested was that genetic exchange could lead to rapid evolutionary change. I've shown you examples of viruses, bacterias, panacos, plants, animals, and I know what he does. So, the, but one of the questions that we have that we don't know the answer to, and it's actually incredibly important, uh, Question is these the novelty that we've detected that I've shown you? Okay, the rapid evolution, uh, whether it's the formation of new lineages, hybrid lineages of species uh, like the great Pogon, Balancholic Lord of Species uh, over the last eight years, or whether it's adaptive changes, you know, the adaptive transfers. Um, does it mean that our global, rapidly global changing? environment may gather some of the status profits for our time. What I mean by that is we're, we're in the middle of a perturb apparent perturbation in climatic uh, events globally. Uh, we can call it global warming, we can call it whatever we want to. The question is to me is will genetic admixture, ongoing genetic Previous mixtures of standing genetic variation that are in those lineages, like us, but also other lineages that are containing a number of quite a bit of genetic enrichment, genomic enrichment, phenotypic enrichment, because of this emergence of genetic exchange. Could it mean that Anderson and Stebbins are giving us some good news about how organisms might be able to track a rapid? Part or the worrying part of this is we would argue that the rapidly changing environment that we're talking about right now is going to be so much more rapid than what we knew before, except in some catastrophic events like the meteor storm that we experienced. Okay? And so it's, the jury is way out on this. I mean, we don't know the answer. I don't have a clue what the answer to this. Uh, but I think, and I suggest this to colleagues that work in conservation biology. I was in Portugal earlier this year at a conservation genomic meeting in the state of Brown, Vermont, and worked with them. And we were talking about it, and I said, we need to think about this, I think, when we're modeling where should we have conservation regions. We need to think about what these kinds of bridges between emergent lineages might look like, might help this help genetic rescue. That's, that's what I would like to say from practical aspects of this as well as the basic science that I hope is addressed. All right. So that's it for now. So if you have any questions, comments, any just questions, arguments. So what they they tie with, they've actually had some really cool tests of how they were able to tie this to sort of data. But what we did when we developed agricultural practices is that, in many cases, this is not the only example, or when we started living in the city, we brought organisms together that had not been together before. And so the camelback were what they had were introgression of they call it integration. Once again, I would call it autophagy training because they kind of make it sound like a second order or whatever. But anyway, they have genes transferred because we brought, because of our development of the 
agricultural practices and animal husbandry and things like that, we brought the contaminations and those integrations. That's why they they go they know the ancestry, they draw the imagery, they know where those genes are coming from. Actually, it's the other species, and so they're able to say, okay, this dates. And it's like looking at when did HIV first enter the population? It's that kind of So, um, well, it, yes and no. Okay? So, it's our, it, it is often because of our practices. So, bush meat honey, okay, exposed apparently is what exposed people to bush meat collection, is what exposed people in Africa initially to HIV. Before that, HIV had recombined to help from SIV to be able to interspecifically transfer, and then the HIV that could be transferred to others. Okay, so there's a lot of recombination going on. And then we exposed ourselves, our species, to that by some of our collection of meat practices. HIV then afterwards, we brought it into the divergent forms. We brought it into Contact with one another and, and produce more additional variable forms by their sexual practices or blood transfusion. So, once again, from our behavior, not necessarily negative behavior, but from our activities. So, yes, there are examples like that where we have, we have definitely brought organisms into, uh, you know, into overlap. Other that had these kinds of recombinations. But, but a lot of, many of the events probably predate us, predate our practices that we've run into those organisms. Um, plague is a good example of that. We have a, a soil bacteria that is non lethal, it's just a mental, but because of a number of transfers of material from other bacteria species. Something that can kill us in large numbers because the genes are not variable form. And that dating is actually relatively ancient, which means that it was living in other places when we came into contact with the ectoparasites or the other mammals and other cells. So it's, it's both and. Some are ancient events that we've run into, and then some we have predated. So that's a good, actually, I'll show you in one of my talks, well, actually, it's happening right now, it's a reproductive device which is something that Kevin has done on the office, but I'll actually put it with you. Um, those two species, the red flower and the blue flower, are both dogs. There's another blue flower form as well. But anyway, those two species have a one month main flowering difference. Sometimes, and, and actually, I've Experiments where we have actually used those same back cross populations and the parents and planted them in the field and that was areas and watched when they flowered and noted down the growth when they flowered. In those time, in those populations, they often don't even overlap. The species don't overlap over time. Okay, but occasionally they will. So it's episodic. In natural hybrid zone populations, where we have both species of hybrid, the hybrids are the bridge. But obviously. So you see overlapping hybridization, I'm sorry, 
flowering plants that bridge those two areas. And that is why we have so many flowers. Parents are still have narrow flowering plants relative to the entire population. But the parents obviously overlap. Occasionally, it is environmentally induced. I mean, certainly it's being pushed around because of cold or wet or whatever else in life. But that's the point. So the question is, is the transfer, is what's transfer regulatory or structural? And the answer is, it's a bit of both, depending on which ones we're looking at. And so, but often, most often it's structural. Okay, and the reason I, the reason I would point that out is what I said about we really never s- assemble the entire any other one as its genome, because a good proportion of our genome is not a repeat of DNA that's ever been assembled. Okay? That would just tell the first part. So what that means is that we're probably missing regulatory elements, but we're getting all the genes. Right? We're getting all of the gene space. So the regulatory elements that are outside, not that far away, cis to the Many of those loci that I showed up there, some of them, like the microRNAs, are actually genetic DNA. So they're loci, but I'm using the word that I put in the book. But they're structured. But anyway, you know what I mean. They're probably doing something regulatory rather than steps. Okay. Anyway, yeah, it's a mixture of both. In those examples I showed, but it's mostly structured for sampling reasons. I would say sampling error. Because we can't say, oh, well, all the introgression that we see is um, the only kind of important introgression is structure. I would argue that that's probably not the case. I would say probably three different ones. I mean, it's a guess. Okay, this is, this is my opinion. It's not based on data. I would argue that maybe not even three times is not enough. Sort of like the butterfly example. You know, regulatory elements didn't shift around. Darwin's finished. Okay, so we have to be real careful with this um, because I want to, we have to separate. So the question is, what about things like human brain health? Well, actually, one of the very first arguments for adapting trait introgression into us from another species was to do with the alleles, loci that affect cortical development and also testing that, and we came out and we started admixing that brain development was affected. And over a very long period of time. <coughs> the, what that doesn't mean is that there isn't the same pattern, say, in the African population. What it, what it doesn't mean is, is, that, is that we haven't had this kind of a amongst all populations in the human family. So, but, if 
looks like, it looks likely that you would have to go through the genetic admixture and probably affect it at the, what the anabolic lenses in particular affect it up to the point of grain and But not everything. That's why I say I have to be careful. It's our brain evolution. The evolution of grain in Homo sapiens and in our genus in general, obviously, Incredibly, before we ever let it happen, and one of the dying ones that we go through is right the same thing as much as I can remember. But it's not really that easy. It's hard to call it a local adaptation if you think of any of those groups as like a hypoxia response to the methods, which is really a different subject than what we're talking about. But yeah, so I think it's a both and kind of situation where it looks very because it's an adaptive trait expression that's going to have to affect us also in our different ways. Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Please understand that when they're doing outlier analyses for what makes us different from chimps, what makes them, which they're doing a lot of those now, a lot of those kinds of analyses uh, at the present time. Remember that a lot of those loci were not in, those are ancient allelic variations. So as proto human and proto chim evolved, we had the fixation of alleles uh, and mutations or whatever else. Maybe it's regression from something else, but let's just assume that that didn't occur. So those kinds of differences built up as well at the same time that we had interesting hybridization between us and bonobo and white gladiators, which we had then. Well, all of this is going on at the same time. And so pleiotropy, epistasis, those kinds of and co-adaptive gene complexes, linkage disequilibrium, all that's building up simultaneously in those gladiators along with these kinds of Once again, I will emphasize that as you read through the material as we go forward in the workshops and my session, as you read through, you'll probably get more and more and more excited, I hope, and confused as you realize how the complexity is just building up. Now, I'll try to get simple answers on this. Simple answers are great. That's why I put, I got things that I need to keep reading here. That's why I put the punctuated equilibrium and the Burns Myers model together with this, the, the, the paper you want to get, the chapter you want to get from Laura that you can use for rapid evolution. So you were asking about punctuated equilibrium and rapid evolution. Is that what you said earlier? You overlay the two on one another, right? And you ask, you ask the process and pattern question. And what I think is that what we've misunderstood is that it actually goes rapid. That it's episodic, right? Does that make sense? I mean, that I'm going to throw a spanner into the works, as they say. Again, let's talk about it this way. Maybe this is maybe this is the way to your question. I talk to the jury once more about this, but when we do, when we, in my lab, try to date events, we use what's called a molecular clock, okay? And so, let's say we use these, which we just did with the program bees, and we ask, when did these diverge, and when are migration events? What we're doing is applying a molecular clock we're saying that 
you've ever stopped, this is 105. Can I answer your question up here? You're out of pain to let people have you on you, are you? Yeah, but I'm, I'm happy to answer your question right now. I just want to let other people stop and 